Once, an old woman came to Buddha and asked him how to meditate. He told her to remain aware of every movement of her hands as she drew the water from the well, knowing that if she did, she would soon find herself in that state of alert and spacious calm that is meditation. When practicing the four foundations of mindfulness, be mindful of every physical movement clearly and without any emotions. In meditation, there are no emotions. One is mindful of any thought and mental state, as well as any feeling, whether it is the suffering of suffering, the suffering of change, or all pervasive suffering. The mind is extremely pure and free from emotional fluctuations. When I teach meditation, I often start by saying, bring your mind home, let it go and relax. I also often say, reflect the light inward, shining the light of mindfulness inward to your afflictions, to your attachments to knowledge and views, and to your mental states. Then, with mindfulness, let go of your attachments and extinguish your afflictions. Bring your mind home, and your mind will become peaceful and joyful. Sentient beings naturally reject the suffering of suffering and embrace and cling to the suffering of change. Now we must train our minds and deal with these habitual tendencies. We should also accept the suffering of suffering openly, without rejection. For example, when our body experiences pain, our mind naturally becomes tense and protective, our muscles contract, and there are even some fear and an increase in heart rate. If you're mindful, you may think, this can eliminate my karma, and it's just the result of a cause. The more pain, the better. Even more pain doesn't matter. Accept the suffering of suffering just as you would accept the suffering of change, with an open heart. This is a significant shift. Our minds become more relaxed and peaceful. Bringing your mind home means to turn your mind inward and rest in its nature. Our minds usually wander and seek outside. But if we reflect the light inward, it's a meditation method that can reveal our true nature. Constantly reflecting in this way can gradually peel away the layers of ignorance, eliminate those subtle attachments, and finally the root ignorance will appear. When the root ignorance is eradicated, you will see your true nature. As a beginner, when you start reflecting the light inward, what you see are still some major afflictions and attachments. When you let go of these, subtler attachments and afflictions will appear. If your meditation skills are not yet strong enough, you can't observe these subtler afflictive obscurations and cognitive obscurations, so you can't relax and release. To release means to release mind from its prison of grasping, since you recognize that all pain and fear and distress arise from the craving of the grasping mind. On a deeper level, the realization and confidence that arise from your growing understanding of the nature of mind inspire the profound and natural generosity. When the awakening mind starts to be generous, 
It's very contrived. The awakening mind forces itself to be generous to others because it feels that it's right to do so. When one is generous, the mind gradually becomes more relaxed. Through constant practice in this way, it will gradually become natural. Generosity will arise easily and become more and more profound. When the mind realizes and sees its true nature, it becomes generous to all beings and things, which is the most profound generosity. In the inspiration of meditation, let go of all attachments. Only in meditation can one use the light of wisdom learned to shine through and ultimately dissolve the attachments. Without meditation, simply having some wisdom on an understanding level is useless, which is merely some understanding. With wisdom and meditation, you can clearly observe the afflictions and attachments and then release them and relax your mind. There is a famous saying, if the mind is not contrived, it is spontaneously blissful, just as water, when not agitated, is by nature transparent and clear. Finally, slip quietly out of the noose of your habitual anxious self. The word slip is interesting, which means to sneak away. Because our afflictions will never allow our mind to be free, they always try to control our mind. Only with wisdom can we slip out of anxiety and afflictions. Let go of all the attachments and enter the true nature of your mind. It is like pouring a handful of sand onto a flat surface. Each grain settles of its own accord. This is how you relax into your true nature, letting all thoughts and emotions naturally subside and dissolve into the state of the nature of mind. The attitude towards thoughts and emotions should be to recognize them as like waves arising from the ocean and eventually returning to it. The awakening mind shouldn't be too attached to these thoughts and emotions as they are impermanent and devoid of inherent nature. Quietly sitting, body still, speech silent, mind at peace, let thoughts and emotions, whatever arises, come and go, without clinging to anything. Don't cling to them or try to push them away, that won't work. Just observe them and let them pass, like a thief sneaking away. Emotions and thoughts will come and go. As we still have karmic habits, they won't be absent. Don't be afraid of thoughts or emotions. The key is to have a clear awareness that sees its true nature. When we maintain awareness, the major afflictions, emotions and thoughts will gradually disappear and we can observe subtler afflictions, thoughts and emotions. What does this state feel like? When we successfully complete a day's work, there's nothing to worry about, nothing hindering in our mind. We feel content and joyful. Then we return home exhausted, completely relaxing on a comfortable sofa or bed. At this point, when the practitioner reflects the light inward, he may see a state of mind that has never appeared before. So when we meditate, it is essential to create the right inner environment of the mind. All effort and struggle comes from not being spacious. When we meditate, we should also have this status, sit, cross legs, relax completely, with no hindrances in the mind and nothing to cling to. 
When worldly people work and interact with others, they always have some motives and always want to gain something or make plans for the future. However, practitioners are different. When interacting with anyone, we always hope that they are well and never want to get anything from them or establish a relationship. We only want to benefit them. If they start to learn Buddhism, gain wisdom, or experience the joy of meditation through our conversations or interactions, that's enough. We don't expect anything from them. Meditators have such a mindset, content, free, and without any attachment. So, as monastics spreading the Dharma, we should also be mindful. When helping those with roots of virtue, we should have no expectation, but maintain a selfless, pure intention to benefit others. When self-attachment comes back, the mind would be no longer pure. Besides, the relationship and connection with sentient beings may also result in attachment. Therefore, to have a right inner environment, it's more important to learn Buddha's wisdom, as only this wisdom can lead to a right inner environment. The minds of sentient beings are constantly making choices either to adopt or to abandon, suffer from gains and losses, and struggling. This is very tiring and getting old quickly. If you want to live longer, you should adjust your mindset. Let go of your attachment on gains and losses, and your lifespan will be extended by half. It's not very hard. Meditation is the most enjoyable experience in life, so meditators are very joyful and happy. First, create a right inner environment, and then you can abide in deep meditation. This is a basic condition for deep meditation. If your attitude is not set right, meditation can't arise. When humour and spaciousness are present, meditation arises effortlessly. Sometimes when we meditate, we don't use any particular method. Just as what I've said, like pouring a handful of sand onto a flat surface. Of course, when starting meditation, it's still necessary to use some methods, such as watching the breath. At the beginning, when the mind is distracted, you need to force yourself to watch your breath. Your mind follows each inhaling and exhaling, like sitting on your breath. Or you can chant a mantra or a Buddha's name. In each repetition, try to listen carefully and distractions will gradually decrease. When starting to practice meditation, it's necessary to use a method. As the meditator progresses and attains the initial stage of enlightenment, he no longer needs to rely on specific methods. He can simply abide in the state of selflessness without any attachments or burdens and without being attached to the act of meditation itself. If you think, well, now I'm going to enter into meditation, you become attached, attached to entering meditation, and you can't enter into meditation. If you are attached to the act of meditation, you can't enter into a proper meditation state. These are subtle hindrances. Meditate without thinking that you're meditating. Let go of the idea that you are meditating. If you think, I'm meditating, I want to enter into meditation, then the idea of meditation has become a real obstacle to entering into meditation. 
With a notion of self in your mind, the surrounding noise would disturb you and even cause complaints. When you meditate, there should be no effort to control and no attempt to be peaceful. If you think, oh, I'm meditating, then you have both the notion of self and the notion of meditation. These two notions will hold you back and prevent you from entering true samadhi, which is a state without any hindrances. You need wisdom to eradicate the notion of self. There should be no notion of self or notion of meditation. Just concentrate on your practice method. This is pretty simple. Just concentrate your mind. For example, if you chant Amitabha Buddha, just concentrate on A. At that moment, there should be no notion of self or notion of meditation. Just concentrate on chanting Amitabha Buddha. Every time you chant, the character A should be heard clearly. Never miss any repetition or lose mindfulness. If there is any wandering thought, the character A can't be heard. You're chanting orally, but your mind hasn't heard it. It hasn't passed through your mind. You're distracted by disturbing thoughts. Some people have been chanting Amitabha Buddha for a long time, but actually haven't heard a word at all. They are not concentrated, so the words just pass by their ears like the wind. Chanting in this way is useless. If you are daydreaming or even thinking of something else, something upset or looking around while loudly chanting Amitabha Buddha, it's useless. When you begin to chant a Buddha's name, you need to chant till your mind is focused without distraction. This is still a rough form of meditation. It means that there shouldn't be any wandering thoughts during each chanting. This is a focused mind without distraction. It needs practice. This is the basic skill. When you can often concentrate without distraction, you may gradually find that you can't even think of Buddha's name anymore. You don't even know when you naturally stop chanting Amitabha Buddha. At that point, any attachments or burdens will be gone and you will have truly entered into meditation. So we should practice meditation, experience and train ourselves more to bring our mind home. Alright, that's all for lecture two.